Good evening, friends, and welcome again to the Pinnacle of Prophecy. We want to welcome those who are joining us across the country and around the world. A very warm welcome to you. Over the past few nights, we've been looking at some very important Bible truths, and we have a number of very important presentations yet to go. So we want to welcome you to tonight's presentation. And we also want to welcome those who are here in person, those from the community, those who are visiting. Welcome. Thank you for being a part of this Bible study experience. Now, just a couple of announcements to bring to your attention. For our friends who are watching online, they notified me just before the program that if you'd like to get the full set of lessons, they are now available at the Amazing Facts Bookstore. I know folks were asking about it. We didn't have them in stock, but they are available now. So if you'd like to get the full color set of lessons, just go to the Amazing Facts Bookstore. I think you can get it at the Amazing Facts website, just amazingfacts.org or .com. Click on the bookstore, and you'll be able to get more information about that. We also have a free gift. It's a book entitled, Does God's Grace Blot Out the Law? And this is our free offer for tonight. If you'd like to receive it, there's several ways that you can get it. It is a digital download. First of all, you can just take a picture of the QR code that you see on your screen, or you can text the word LAW7 to the number 40544 to receive a digital download. If you're outside of North America, just go to the website, pinnacleofprophecy.com, and you'll be able to download the book, a digital version, Does God's Grace Blot Out the Law? It goes along with tonight's presentation, very important study that we have in store for you this evening. But as you know, we like this to be interactive, so we want to give people an opportunity to ask their Bible questions. But before we get to our questions, I almost forgot, we've got a theme song that we like to sing. So I'd like to invite Nathan to come out, and Jackie's on the piano. Now, we've done it several times, so we're going to just have you stand right away. And we're going to sing together, okay? So let's stand. The words will be on the screen. Jesus, shine on me. Jesus, shine on me Everywhere I go When I follow fast And if I listen slow On bright mountains high In dark valleys low Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the opportunity to open your word and study. Father, you have said that we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. Father, you've told us that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path and it will guide us into your perfect will. And Jesus, you have said that you have come to give us life, to give it more abundantly. So what a privilege it is for us to be able to open your word and to read and to study and to learn. And so we do ask for your presence to be with us this evening. Send your spirit to speak to each of our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I want to thank our musicians, Nathan, Jackie, for leading us in that song. You know, earlier today I was walking around and that little tune is real catchy, isn't it? Jesus, shine on me. It just popped in my head. Started singing the song. And I bet you that's happened to some of you as well. If you've been coming and singing along, it's just a great little song of beautiful words. Well, as we mentioned earlier, we like to take your Bible questions. So if you have a Bible question, for those who are watching, you can ask your question by simply taking a picture of the QR code, and you can ask your question right there. You'll see it. If you have a question, scan the QR code. It'll take you directly to a site. You don't have to register. You don't have to give us your email or anything like that. You can just type your Bible question in right there on the site, and we'll try to answer as many of these questions as we can from, from night to night. And again, we are just delighted that Pastor Doug and his wife, Karen Batchelor, are going to be leading out in our questions. So let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you, Pastor Ross and Jackie and Nathan and Mrs. Batchelor. And welcome, everybody, to the Pinnacle of Prophecy program. And we, we think that uh, you're going to be really blessed and glad that you came here tonight as opposed to places other people might be going. <laughs> For our friends that are watching, this was 
Halloween here. And we're so thankful these folks faithfully came. Amen. It doesn't look like anyone's dressed up unusually. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they're didn't all say none of you are unusual, but no one's dressed, dressed up. They're all dressed in their evening wear. That's right. So thank you so much. And I want to welcome our friends who are watching on satellite television or the internet. And you can text your friends right now and tell them to tune in. But we're going to get to as many Bible questions as we can. All right. Are you going to scoot over just a tad? Thank you. Man, All right. Awesome. I know. Okay. I keep pushing them away. It's not nice. Okay. Here's our first question. Can I get my Bible? Oh, would you like your Bible? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Here you go. Okay. All right. We, we did practice this. Okay. What do I do after I accept Christ into my life? Very important question. We talked a couple of nights ago about the everlasting gospel. It's in Revelation 14. So you've asked Jesus into your heart, what now? Well, when you ask a man, you believe that he forgives you, and he gives you a new beginning. Amen. He promises to forgive all of your sins. So what do you do if you're a newborn babe to grow? Well, you need to eat. This is the bread of life. Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What else does a baby do? We mentioned already, a baby breathes. You need to pray and then share your faith, exercise your faith. As you read the Bible, you're going to be challenged to do things that you find in the Bible. Start putting them into practice. And um, if you do those things, you will grow. Don't be discouraged if you fall along the way. That's normal. And just get back up and keep going. Amen? Amen. All right. As a baby Christian, just starting my journey with God, if Jesus were to return tomorrow or next week, is it too late for me? Well, if you've just come to the Lord, God knows where you are. He's not going to try and catch you off guard. Amen. And so if you're you know, coming to the Lord and you've got uh, some growing left to do, he's not going to try to take you out early. He knows you're drawing near to him. The promise is if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. And he says he is the author and the finisher of your faith. The Lord is a desperate to save you. He's not trying to catch you unprepared. Uh, God is long-suffering to us, word. As a parent pities their children, so the Lord pities his children. He desperately wants you to be saved. Don't doubt his love for you or his desire to save you. Cooperate with the Holy Spirit, and he will transform you. That's right. I've been a Christian for many years, but I find that I continue to make the same mistakes. How long will God continue to forgive me? Well, I don't want to put you on the spot, but how many of you are willing to admit that you've made the same mistake more than once? And you ask God to forgive you for the same thing more than once. My hand's up. The Bible says a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus cast seven devils. Don't give up. Amen. Now, do not get comfortable with sin. You should never get comfortable with sin. It's like you grieve away the Holy Spirit. But be honest with your own soul. If you've done something wrong, tell the Lord right away. It's dangerous to continue in sin willfully, the Bible says. If you're willfully continuing in sin, there's no sacrifice for that. You need to be willing to repent, and that means turn away. But if you repent and you fall again, get back up. Because like a baby learning to walk, as I mentioned, you're going to stumble now. If you find 20 years later that baby's still stumbling and can't get the food in its mouth, you've got a problem. Mm. So there should be growth. And uh, that's sometimes what the problem is. Peter said, at the time you should be eating meat, you're still drinking milk. Uh, even back in Peter's day, the churches weren't growing. And so we need to mature in our relationship, gather when God's people come together, study his word, read the Bible, even the times you may not feel like it, even if you don't always understand it. Mm -hmm. Does a baby understand everything the parents say when it first talks to them? No. It's a miracle they learn to talk at all, the way some parents talk to babies. <laughs> Use baby language, you know? But they keep listening, and gradually they start understanding, don't they? It's amazing how they learn a language in three years. Mm -hmm. So keep listening. It'll, you'll understand him more and more. And sometimes I find if I'm uh, falling in the same sin, same trap, I have to stop and look and think, how am I setting myself up to mm -hmm. succeed 
and how am I setting myself up to fail? Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, if you've so got a really problem with too. ice cream, don't keep going down the frozen food section <laughs> in the store. That was my issue. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so that's important too. How is Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God one person? Yeah, sometimes this is called the Trinity, though the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. The teaching does, and it confuses people. You know, Moses said, Hear, O Israel, Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Lord our God is one. But then the Bible says, Jesus said, Go forth, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the Hebrew mind, when you say one, it's not always thinking of quantity, numerical quantity. Jesus said, for example, a man will leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, and they too become one flesh, right? Mm -hmm. That means they're together, there's a harmony there. So between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, they are one. Not like the Greek or Egyptian gods where they're all gods of different things and they fight with each other. God is a, a God of unity, perfect love, perfect unity. But there are three distinct persons. God said, let us make man in our image. The language is very clear. It's plural. And the teaching is all through the Bible. I got a book on that if you're interested. All right. Here's another one. Can the mark of the beast be removed if you have a change of heart? Yeah, good question. Uh, no. And that, of course, is in Revelation 14. Uh, the most fearful curse in the Bible. Some people think the, only the curses are in the Old Testament. Uh, some of the most frightening pronouncements and plagues are in the New Testament and Revelation. Is pronounced on those who receive the mark of the beast. And once a person receives that, there's nothing to indicate that they can change. There's a place in Revelation chapter 22 where it says, Let him that is unjust be unjust still. Let him who is filthy be filthy still. He that is holy be holy still. He that is righteous, righteous still. I'm paraphrasing. But there comes a point when probation closes and there's no changing teams. And if a person receives the mark of the beast, uh, I don't find any indication that they're then going to be waffling back and forth. Seal of God, no, mark of the beast. Yeah, mark, no, I don't want to. I think I'll take the seal of God. People that make that decision, it usually is a permanent decision. It's because they've grieved away the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and exactly. And there's, there's no um, opportunity for them because they don't have a desire to hear nope. the Holy Spirit working in their lives. That's so they right. won't choose. That's the sad part. All right. If your spouse dies and you remarry and both go to heaven, who are you married to? Well, you know, they asked Jesus this question, the Sadducees, that did not believe in the resurrection. I think it's in Matthew chapter... Matthew chapter 22, when he talks about, um, they, oh, they tell this scenario. Yeah, it starts with verse 23. Man gets married and he has, this lady gets married and her husband dies. She marries the brother. He dies. She marries the brother. He dies. After three, I want to marry her anymore because I figure she's bad <laughs> luck. But people keep marrying her. The poor, the poor mother. <laughs> yeah, really. Lose all seven kids. Yeah. And, and then finally she dies. And they said, who's she married to? And they thought they stumped Jesus. Jesus' response is, and this is verse 29, you're mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they're like the angels of God in heaven. So angels don't marry. And in the resurrection, see, God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and fill the earth, populate the earth. The new earth is now going to be populated with the redeemed. Mm -hmm. So there's probably no new births. The children that are resurrected will go forth and grow up. Children will be in the resurrection, and they'll grow up. But I don't think the Bible teaches people will continue to procreate. Eventually, you know, it wouldn't take long for them to just be spilling off the planet. <laughs> so uh, God wanted the wor world to be filled to an appropriate number, whatever that is. And uh, what about the big question? If you've had multiple marriages and you get to heaven, who are you married to? Now, this is a, an interesting question. Adam and Eve, God performed their wedding. They both died. No indication they married anyone else. When they get to heaven, does God give them divorce papers? No. No. I think you can still be married with your best friend and life partner. You can spend time with them. There probably won't be procreation. When I tell teenagers that, they go, Oh, no. I said, don't worry. I promise. Just get to heaven. You'll be happy. 
No, really, I do this with college students that aren't married yet. And they think, if Jesus comes before I get married, how am I ever going to be happy in heaven? I said, don't worry, just get there. I promise you'll be happy. Amen. But um, in cases where people like David had multiple wives, who's he married to in heaven? Ultimately, we're all married to the Lord, right? Uh, everyone's going to be friends. Here's something for you to think about. David and Bathsheba and Uriah mm -hmm. will all be friends in heaven. You know the story? I'm not telling you. You can look it up if you don't know it. <laughs> all right. Does the Bible indicate that God has given man 6,000 years to live on earth? If so, is there a possibility that Jesus could return in the year 2031? Yeah, you remember I told you when we talked about the second coming, try to avoid pinpointing a date because you can almost be sure whatever date you're going to pick, you'll be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, could he come then? Yes, he could come sooner. He could come later. I told you there's verses where it says that God is a long-suffering. It could be later. Uh, it could be sooner. It says that except those days be short and no flesh would be saved. Is God going to work on a, a schedule, as I mentioned the other night, of 6,000 years and then 1,000 years in heaven? Possibly. I think that might be a, you know, a big template, but I wouldn't use it to set a date. So... Uh, all I know is Jesus said, in such an hour you think not. And keep in mind, Christ said, as it was in the days of Noah and Lot, people were buying and selling and marrying and giving in marriage and building and planting. They're doing all these things as though they got long-term plans. You don't get married if you don't think you got time. You don't farm or build if you don't think you have time. And then it happens. So I think the world's going to be surprised. But Paul says to the church, you are not children of the night that that day should overtake you as a thief. It'll come as a thief for most of the world, but it doesn't need to come as a thief for you. He's given a sign so we know when the time is near, and our study tonight will also help explain that. You know, and it's not just in the future when we think of Jesus coming in far, far away or, or two years or five years or whatever. We don't know how long we have to live. There could be an accident that happens on our way home. So it's important for us to be ready all the time. That's right. Amen. Scary uh, thought. Okay. Yeah, it is. It is. Okay. Are your spirit and soul the same? You know, that, the two phrases are used uh, several times in the Bible. Sometimes the context is different, but typically no. The Bible tells us God breathed into Adam the spirit, the breath of life. It's the word breath and spirit. It's ruach in Hebrew. And it says, then he became a living soul. So it identifies the spirit of life or breath of life breathed into Adam. I said, no, Adam. He became a living soul. Soul, spirit, are used differently. Okay. Are Christians allowed to have unbelieving friends? Did Jesus have non-Christian friends? That's how they became Christians. Amen. So, yeah, yeah you've got to start somewhere. Uh, now, th that's also a, a good question because a Christian needs to be in the world without the world being in the Christian. Mm -hmm. We're like boats in the water. Matter of fact, a boat on dry land looks a little bizarre. That's why Noah got such a hard time. <laughs> but uh, if the water gets in the boat, you have a different problem, don't you? So you need to know how to be friends so that you are influencing them. If you hang out with too many non-Christian friends, you realize they're influencing you, then you need to mitigate that. Mm. And so you want to make sure you have a good Christian support group. So as you do mission work among non-Christian friends, you may work with or go to school with or witness to, that you know, you're, you're not being drawn into their ungodly language, lifestyle, ways, you know what I mean? but you need to have relationships with people so you can reach them. Does that make sense? Yes. The second commandment states, thou shalt not have any graven image before me. Does that also mean pictures of Jesus? Uh, no, uh, but it could be. <laughs> Let me explain. The second commandment, we're going to be talking about the commandments tonight, says you shall not make unto you any graven image, the likeness of anything in the heaven above or the earth beneath or the water under the earth and you shall not bow down yourself to them and serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity upon the fathers to the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. I like the last part. But showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and, and keep, keep my commandments. So he said, do not make the likeness of anything and bow down to it. 
He did not forbid making a likeness. How do you know that? He commanded them to make likenesses other times. He told Moses to make a serpent and put it on a pole, tell everyone to look at it and they'd be forgiven or healed from the venom mm. of the snake. He told Solomon to have 12 calves that were put underneath the laver. He told Moses to put two angels on the Ark of the Covenant and to engrave angels on the walls of the sanctuary. So just making a likeness or facsimile of something is not a sin in and of itself. But, you know, where in the Catholic Church they often pray to statues. We were just in the Vatican mm -hmm. uh, a few months ago. Uh, in the Orthodox churches they pray to paintings and icons. They carry them up and down the street. So it could be a stumbling block for somebody if you had a picture of Jesus and for you it's just, you know, a nice picture but someone else might come in and, you know, they start worshiping it. Mm. So you don't want to do anything that's going to make somebody stumble and you, you need to be wise. Nothing wrong with having a photograph. There are some churches that say it's a sin to have a photograph in your wallet. But not ours. No, we don't teach that. Okay. All right, for our last question. All right. How long has God lived? All right, some of our questions we think come in from young viewers. How long has God lived? Great question. I'm stumped. <laughs> but, um, you know, the Bible says from everlasting to everlasting. Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega. He has always existed. Now, our minds can't get wrapped around that. I mean, you just try to imagine if you could fire a bullet out in space that could travel a thousand times faster than the speed of light, does it ever reach nothingness? We just launched the James Webb Telescope and they thought they'd see the outer edges of the universe where it ends. No. They saw just an infinite number of more galaxies beyond, beyond, beyond. And the immensity of space is mind-boggling when you look at the cosmos. God is eternal. We can't comprehend it. The Bible says, as the heaven are, heavens are high above the earth, so are his ways above our ways. And some things we need to just smile and say, no, I'm glad you're God, and uh, be content with that. But he has always existed. Thank you. We may be out of time for our questions. So I want to remind you, if you want to put in your questions, all you have to do is you take your camera. Hopefully you all know how to do this. You aim the camera at that QR code. We'll leave it up for a moment and scan that. It'll take you to the website. You can post your questions, and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. But now, just a moment for a little pinnacle perspective with Pastor Ross. That's right, Pastor Doug. And you got a lint here. It's going to drive I me crazy. Oh, I'm so you. OCD. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Well, you we probably should tell people why we sit down, because you're going to be standing for a long time yet to come. Getting old. And uh, our producer says it looks better to have some variety, standing and sitting, so we're sitting. Okay. And yet it's an important topic we want to yeah. talk about. Last night, many of you know, we spoke about the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. You and mean course, two nights ago? Two nights, that's right. right. We were off last night, that's right. And there's a lot of confusion in the world, at least the Christian world, about how Jesus is going to come. Mm -hmm. Some people say that he comes at conversion, personally. Other people say that Christ's coming is a death. Other people say, well, he's going to come secretly. And there's a lot of confusion. But the Bible makes it very clear that when Jesus comes, it's going to be a literal, personal, visible, powerful, glorious event. But then somebody might say, well, what about that verse that says one's taken and the other's left? And you actually mentioned that in your presentation. Mm -hmm. So let me read that passage, and then, Pastor Doug, why don't you explain this to us? Okay. You find this in Luke, Luke chapter 17. We'll take a little time to answer this question, because this is an important one. Luke chapter 17, starting verse 34. Jesus speaking to the disciples, he says, I tell you that in that night there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken, and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken, and the other left. And two men will be in the field... The one will be taken and the other left. And then they answered and they said to him, Where, Lord? So he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. So is this first supporting a secret rapture where somebody just disappears and somebody else is left? Well, why don't we start with the last part of that? It says one is taken. And this verse is probably one of the most popular verses that's used to support the idea of a secret rapture. It's, you know, two people are outside doing one thing and one's taken, the other one's left behind still ostensibly doing the same thing, whether it's harvesting or grinding or sleeping. And it looks like they've just disappeared. But then the disciples conclude by saying, where? Where what? Where are they taken? It's not saying where are they left, right? Where are they taken? And what's the answer? Wherever the eagles, and the word eagles there means vultures. 
birds of carrion, wherever the eagles are gathered, that's where the body is. Or wherever the body is, that's where the eagles are. Now, you, to know how the Bible history works, the children of Israel, when they were good, they got to stay in the promised land. When they misbehaved and they disobeyed, they were carried away. They were taken away in judgment. The Bible says the flood, speaking of Noah, or the wicked in the time of Noah, the flood came and took them all away. You want to be taken like that? It says they're taken where the vultures are. So not only do they have the, the uh, issue confused, they got where they're going confused. Now, I know there are, there's two different places where two different Greek words are used, but let's talk about that. Two women. What does a woman, I haven't gotten to this in the seminar yet, but what does a woman represent in Bible symbology, analogy, prophecy? I've heard many of you saying that. A church. The Bible says, husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church. A woman is often a symbol of a church. There are two women in Revelation, don't forget. One pure, one is a harlot. Two opposites. We're going to get to that. So they're outwardly doing the same thing. What are they doing? They're grinding grain, bread. What is the bread? You got two women outwardly doing the same thing. One is true, one is false. Do you realize there's only two kinds of people in the world? There's only two roads. Salvation, the road to heaven, and the road to the wide road to destruction. So you got two women outwardly doing the same thing. One is taken away in judgment and one is saved. You've got two men sleeping in a bed. What does sleep represent in the Bible? Jesus said, our friend Lazarus sleeps. They said, oh, good Lord, he's going to get all refreshed. He said, no, no, he's dead. Right? John 11. How many kinds of people are sleeping right now? Two. The Bible says the dead in Christ rise first. The rest of the dead, the wicked, come forth in the second resurrection. That's Revelation 20. So, talking about one is taken, one is left. Then you've got the um, two men working in a field. What is a field? Jesus said the harvest is great. He's sowing the seed. What's the seed? The seed is the word of God. They're outwardly doing the same things. One is true, one is false. So, people I think misunderstand that Christ is using uh, typical symbols and the disciples often misunderstood that. You know, Jesus would say, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And the disciples started looking around in the boat saying, did we forget the lunch again? <laughs> and Jesus said, no, I'm talking about spiritual leaven, teaching. So often they took what he said literally. And, uh, you know, Christ said at one time, and if you don't have a sword, you better buy one. Sell your garment and buy one. So Peter said, I've got two swords. And Jesus said, oh, enough of this. You don't get it. He's talking about the word of God. And so this is one of those cases where Jesus is employing symbols He's not saying that all of a sudden people are going to disappear and life goes on because we've learned when the day of the Lord comes as a thief, and this is in uh, 2, Peter chapter th 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, when the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, the heavens pass away with a great noise, the elements melt with fervent heat, the earth and the works that are therein are burned up. You can also read in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23, that there's a day when the earth is broken down and there's no man alive. In the secret rapture scenario, there's always someone here on earth alive. So, again, Isaiah says, I'll make the earth utterly empty. Uh, there's a time when the Lord comes and the saints are caught up and the wicked are destroyed. There's no one alive. The earth is empty of inhabitants. Um, the only scenario that fits is the old, glorious second coming scenario. All right, Pastor, I'm looking at the time. We probably have time to talk about one other quick question that we have. Somebody asks, is it a lack of faith to ask God for a sign? No, there's uh, saints in the Bible that sometimes ask for signs. Gideon asked for a sign. Hezekiah asked for a sign. Uh, Jesus said, blessed are those who believe without seeing. That's better. Okay. Well, we want to remind the folks who are watching, tomorrow's night's program is called Worshiping the Creator. Probably one of the most important presentations. I mean, they're all oh, good. Man. They're all important. But tomorrow in particular, you don't want to miss tomorrow's presentation, Worshiping the Creator. But we've got an important presentation right now. Welcome back, friends, to the Pinnacle of Prophecy. 
we've got an exciting topic that we're going to be studying tonight. It's called the law of God. For our friends who are watching, you can download for free tonight's lesson by simply going to uh, pinnacleofprophecy.com, and you'll see it right there. You can just download tonight's lesson. If you've missed any of the previous lessons, you can also download it there at the site. For those of you who are here in person, it might be a good time to grab your lesson. We're going to go through it. I hope you following along and filling in the answers as we go through. It's a great resource that will be a blessing to you. Welcome, friends, to the Pinnacle of Prophecy uh, meetings. I want to welcome those who have joined us that are watching again on TV or online. And uh, we are going through a new set of lessons that are based on Revelation chapter 14. And uh, it is a springboard to study the whole Bible, and in particular, the prophecies of the last days. And so we're just so thankful that you're here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church and you there are watching. Tonight's study is on the laws of life. And, uh, you know, while some people might be thinking, oh, you can talk about the law? Isn't that legalistic? Well, it's a Bible subject, and it is in the book of Revelation, and it is a big issue in the last days. I always like to start with a little amazing fact, kind of bittersweet. Guinness Book of World Records records the person who has been arrested the most in history is a man named Tommy Johns from Brisbane, Australia, arrested 3,000 times for drunkenness and disorderly behavior, conduct. Now, that doesn't sound as violent and terrible as some things, but I think we all know that lawlessness seems to be on the rise. Do any of you remember a day when you didn't even lock your doors in your house? Don't raise your hand if you do it now. Someone will be watching. They'll look you up on the Internet. <laughs> but um, let's admit it, you know, times have changed, and the values and the morals of the culture have changed. Now, I was not raised in a religious home. Uh, my mother was from a Jewish background, but she was basically atheist. And my father, he was raised Baptist, but after World War II, he was basically atheist. So I didn't grow up with a lot of strong religious training, but... Um, I still remember when I went to public school in California, they had the Ten Commandments on the wall. They called it the Golden Rules. Any of you remember that? Public school. And then, you know, more people were worried about separation of church and state, and we'll talk a little about that tonight. And pretty soon they weren't there anymore. And I can understand the government telling people, you're not supposed to dictate the first four commandments. What God's name is or what God you worship or how you worship him or what his name is or when you worship him. But the government must enforce the last six commandments. Parental authority. The government doesn't own your children. Things like property rights, the sanctity of marriage. Shouldn't it be coveting your neighbor's things? Um, honesty, telling the truth. These are things that must be observed and enforced by any civilized culture. And America was built on those principles by Roger Williams where you basically separate the two tables of stone and uh, the government doesn't meddle with the first four, but they must enforce the last six. And that's what made it such a great country. But they, in not wanting any mingling of religion, they took all of the law out, which is kind of strange because it's up on the Supreme Court building. Got a picture of Moses up there. Did you know that? Now, we are using this as a foundation for our studies each night. Revelation 14. What is our verse in Revelation 14, and how does that relate? It's in verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Talking about the ones that are saved as opposed to the ones with the mark. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here you've got the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The Bible calls it the law and the prophets. And so this is something that's crucial in the life of a believer. They were, we're not just hearers of the word, but we're doers of the word. So with that background, let's get into the questions. And remember, when you see an answer in blue, you're invited to call it out along with me. First question, what is God's moral law? Not to be confused with lots of different laws in the Bible, there's a very simple moral law. What is it? You can read in Exodus 24, verse 12, Then the Lord said to me, to Moses rather, 
Come up to me on the mountain, and there I will give you what? Tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. He gave them these two tables of stone. And what were they? Deuteronomy 10, 4. And he wrote on the tables according to the first writing the Ten Commandments which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day the Lord assembled and the Lord gave them to me. So when God delivered the Ten Commandments, He did something He had never before done in history. Not one prophet or two having a vision or a dream, but while a whole nation was gathered in assembly, the Lord God Almighty spoke audibly, and no artificial PA system, and He declared the Ten Commandments with thunder and lightning from the mountain. It was heard by the whole nation, and the nation said, all the Lord has said we will do. And then Moses said, they've agreed to the covenant. God says, okay, we're agreeing to the terms. Come up, I'll give you a written copy. That's how contracts work. First, you kind of work it out verbally, right? No sense writing it up every time. First, get a verbal agreement. Then you say, that sounds good. Then you write it up, make it official. This is what God did. And He gave them the Ten Commandments. What happened to the Ten Commandments? It says, and I turned, Moses said, I came down from the mountain and I put the tables in the ark which I had made and there they are just as the Lord commanded me. Some people are wondering, where are the Ten Commandments today? You know, they made some movies about Raiders of the Lost Ark and others that have been made. And some are saying, you know, they're in Ethiopia. Have you heard that? I've heard people say, yeah, Solomon had an affair with the Queen of Sheba and she got pregnant and he said, well, don't, you know, don't advertise this and I'll give you our most holy treasure out of our sanctuary, the Ten Commandments. And the Ethiopians say they have it there. Now, nothing to be disrespectful. That's not in the Bible. In fact, long after Solomon, you can read in 2 Chronicles 35, verse 3, 600 A.D., Solomon lived about 1,000 A.D. 600 A.D., Josiah still has the temple, and he says the Ten Commandments are still in the temple. They were finally hidden, as near as we can tell, by Jeremiah and maybe some of the faithful priests. God told Jeremiah, Nebuchadnezzar is going to destroy the city. He's going to burn the temple. Nebuchadnezzar carried off the articles, and it enumerates most of the articles. Never mentions the ark. It's never heard from again. Jeremiah, knowing that the city was going to be attacked and conquered, yeah, undoubtedly they hid it in one of the honeycombs of caves that are under Jerusalem somewhere. And it's still there today. So when people tell you the Egyptians captured it, or the uh, Babylonians got it, or the uh, uh, Ethiopians have it, it is missing. Wouldn't it be something if it was discovered? See those stones written by the finger of God? It was the national treasure. Think about that. The whole nation of Israel, what made it the holy place, what made them the holy people, the holy mountain, the holy temple, was in the middle of the temple in the holy of holies, you had the holy law of God written by the finger of God. And on stone. How many of you would like to see that? It's in your Bible. People get all excited. Oh, boy, it'd be something. I'd go around the world if I could see the ark. Well, the ark is just the box. It's the rocks in the box that are important. And God wants those rocks in our head. Thy word I have hidden in my heart. That's what that means. That I might not sin against thee. He wants the law in our minds and our hearts. Amen? Amen. Number two, to what, uh, to what does the Bible equate God's law? Answer? Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Now, part of the reason for the lesson tonight, I'm just going to tell you up front, is because we know that there's a lot of lawlessness in society and people that don't want the law, but what scares me is there are pastors now that are saying we don't want the law. There are pastors that are turning away from the law. They're saying, oh, we're, we're not under the law anymore. We're under grace, and that means we don't need to keep the Ten Commandments. How many of you have heard that? Okay. That is a lie. Paul talks about doctrines of devils, and if there's a doctrine of devils, the idea that God doesn't care whether or not you keep the Ten Commandments is a categorical lie, and I can tell you that based on an abundance of Scripture I'm going to share with you tonight. He did not give us the Ten Suggestions. They are not the Ten Recommendations. They're the Ten Commandments, and God did not make a mistake. 
And I've heard pastors say, well, God gave them a law just to prove they couldn't keep it, and then He punished them for not keeping it. What parent does that? You command your children to do something, and then you punish them for not doing it. Every command of God, inherent is the command, is the power to do it. Now, I can understand why some people would be frustrated by any law because we're living in a country right now where we've got 30,000 laws. And every time Congress gets together, they make about another 200 since, what is it, 1789. You know who needs law? Lawless. You know they've got a law, some states, let me see. Bathing in Nashville in a city fountain is prohibited. How did that law come about? <laughs> Somebody bathed in a fountain. Putting a skunk in your boss's desk is against the law. How did that happen? Now, one of them that I thought was really interesting, it said, in Kentucky, you cannot carry ice cream in your pocket. <laughs> How did that get on the books? That must have been a slow day at the courthouse. When that happened, they've got some cities have some really strange laws. In Washington, dogs are not allowed to bark after 6 p.m. I wonder if the dogs can read that law. <laughs> In Canada, it is unlawful to lend your vacuum cleaner to your neighbor. What? You could ostensibly spread your dust mites to their house. I don't know, but that's the law. There are so many laws. You know the amazing thing about the Ten Commandments? 300 words. God was able to encompass moral behavior. Do you know there's really no sin you can commit that doesn't somehow fit under one of the Ten Commandments? The Ten Commandments are simple, but they're comprehensive. They cover just about every relationship of humanity. And it, it's beautiful. It's God's uh, perfect plan for man. You can read where it says in Isaiah 5, 16, the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness. God is holy. His law is holy. It furthermore says in Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, all of His ways are what? Justice. They're justice. God is just and holy and good. Now, we're not good, but who is good? The Bible says no one is good but one. This is the words of Jesus. No one is really good but one, and that is God. He said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. Humanity sins. God's provided a way for us to be saved from our sins. And there's only one that is good that has ever lived, and that's God. Now, Jesus said that. Was he saying he wasn't good, or was he saying he was God? Jesus is God the Son. Amen? So, why can we not get rid of the Ten Commandments? Because when you look at the definition for the Ten Commandments in the Bible, the same words are used to describe God himself. For example, the Bible says God is perfect. The Bible says in Psalm 19, verse 7, the law is perfect. By the way, the verse for God being perfect is Jesus, Matthew 5, 48, be therefore perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. The Bible says God is love. 1 John 4, 8, many places. Romans 13, 10 says the law is love. The Bible says God is righteous. Exodus 9, 27, it says the law is righteous. And you got the verses on the screen, Psalm 119. God is truth. The law is truth. God is pure, the law is pure. God is spiritual, the law is spiritual. God is eternal, the law is eternal. God is unchangeable. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Lord, I change not. His law is unchangeable. It says, I will not alter the covenant that has gone out of my lips. So to say that God's law is changeable, you know, I can think of a couple of kings in the Bible that made laws they wanted to change and they couldn't. King Ahasuerus made a law that all the Jews would be attacked on a certain day. Then his wife Esther said, I'm a Jew. He could not cancel his law. He could only make another law that gave them a right to preemptively attack their enemies. King Darius made a law that if you prayed to anyone but him for 30 days, you're going to the lion's den. But then he forgot about Daniel who prays three times a day. And he didn't want Daniel to be killed. But it was the law of the Medes and the Persian which changes not. King Herod told his stepdaughter, if you dance for me, I'll give you anything you ask for up to half the kingdom. She said, I want the head of John the Baptist. He didn't want to do that, but he had made a vow, and he's a king in front of all these guests. He could not change his word. 
these earthly, vacillating, sinful kings could not change their law, how could anyone think the king of the universe is going to speak his law from a mountain, write it with his finger, in stone no less, and say, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't have to keep it anymore. The Ten Commandments are eternal, friends. And all of God's universe is ordered by law. You know, they did a study that uh, years ago, they were checking on the security of children, and they, they observed children that were playing in a playground in a park where there was no fence around the playground, and they noticed the kids stayed really close to the swing set in the gym. They were afraid to venture out at all because they, there was no boundaries. So then they made a big fenced-in area around the playground. All of a sudden, they spread out, and they felt relaxed, and they had less stress because there were boundaries. They were happier. Now, I don't have the time to tell you my testimony, but I went to 14 different schools growing up. I went to two military schools, and I went to one school that was an experimental school with no rules. The military school was the strictest school in North America. It was New York Military Academy. Still around today. It's the same school Donald Trump went to. And they had a rule for everything how to fold your underwear, and how to hang your clothes, how to stack your books, you expect your rooms every morning, all kinds of rules. Then I went to this experimental hippie school. It's a long story. No rules. Three rules, really. No fighting, no sex, no drugs. The students paid no attention to the three rules. <laughs> it was a wild party for the whole year. You didn't have to go to class if you didn't want to. You didn't have to go to meals if you didn't want to. I mean, I know you, you, you don't think this is true. Look up Pine Hinge on the internet. I went to the school called Pine Hinge. It lasted five years. The experiment failed. Where do you think I was happier? Military school. I was learned self-control, discipline. Ask Karen. I still make the bed every day. I mean, I, I, you learn some order. You learn some purpose. The kids in the free school wanted to commit suicide. Because they had no purpose. They had no order. They had no guidelines. You cannot be happy without God's law. God's law is not to take away our happiness. The law of the Lord is good. Converting the soul. It's just and holy and perfect. It's sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. These are the words that David uses. And yet, some people are talking about the law like, oh, that's a bummer. Oh, I think you got a legalist you're dealing with. Yeah, but God's law, rightly taught, is a blessing, friends. And church should not be afraid of it. I was doing a TV interview with my friend John Lomacain. Some of you have seen him on TV. He and I were invited to a Christian TV station to debate two other ministers on the law of God. And in the discussion, they said, well, nobody can really keep the law. I said, well, I agree that we all sin, but Jesus saves us from our sin, and he can give us victory over our sins. So well, nobody can keep the law. I wanted to ask him, have you told your wife that you can't keep the seventh commandment? Yes, we can. I know there's a spiritual side of the law and there's a letter of the law, but yes, you cannot murder. You cannot steal. It is possible to not curse. And though people may stumble, your goal should be to live by the law. I mean, it's God's will. It's the most perfect expression of the will of God. It tells us in Psalm 119, verse 45, I will walk at liberty because I keep thy precepts. James calls it the, the law of liberty. And so we shouldn't be afraid of the law. Number three, what law, what does God's law do? Well, for one thing, it tells us our need of a Savior. You can read in Romans 7, 7, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law said, you shall not covet. And so, you know, God gives us law because we need it to avoid disobedience. You can also read here, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, is it important for us to know what sin is? How can you repent from your sins if you don't know what sin is? If the devil takes away the law, without the law, there's no sin. You with me? If there's no sin, do we need a Savior? The Lord gives us the law so we'll recognize when we've disobeyed, disobeyed and we can repent and turn from our disobedience and turn to Jesus for mercy and power. But the law is a blessing. And again, the best Bible definition for what sin is, sin is lawlessness. If you get the King James Version, sin is the transgression of the law. 
People who are taking away the law are taking away the very definition of sin, and the devil loves that because Jesus wants us to know what our sins are so that he can forgive us. He's talking to the woman at the well, and she's, you know, asking him why he's even talking to her, and they're wanting to argue religion. He said, go call your husband. She wanted to change the subject. She said, well, I don't have a husband. He said, that's right. You've had five husbands, and the one you're living with now you're not married to. Why did Jesus do that? Because he wanted to save her, but he had to put his finger on something deliberate, something real in her life where she was out of God's will. And he then revealed he was the Messiah and he forgave her and she became a witness for him. But God needs to make us aware of our sin. The Bible says, turn ye, turn ye, why will you die? He wants us to know. So it's, it's very important. Yes, it is possible to break God's law. I heard about a lady that she was mailing the old family Bible to her brother across the country, and so she put it in this big box. She carried it to the post office because they had to weigh it. She puts it on the scale, and the lady postmaster looks at it, and she says, is there anything breakable in here? She said, just the Ten Commandments. <laughs> it is breakable. So let me illustrate. The Bible says it is by the law we know what sin is. So let's just suppose for a moment That if I was to go through, wasn't that tricky? If I was to go through the presentation like this, would that be at all distracting? I used to do this where I would very slyly put a mark on my head and then I'd act like I didn't know it was there and people were all looking at each other like, should someone say something? And now I'm just a little more blunt about it. But uh, this would be distracting. Do you see something wrong with my appearance? Oh, huh? Some are going, no. I mean, would you go out the door like this? No, all right. Do you realize I don't see anything? And, you know, I came to the meeting tonight, and I brushed, gargled, deodorized, do everything, and, and uh, I feel fine. Now, how are you going to convince me there's a problem? A mirror, how convenient. So, I feel fine, I'm preaching, I'm talking, you're all saying, Doug, you, you got an issue. And I said, no, I don't. You said, look in the mirror. I look in the mirror and I go, oh, man, that does really look foolish. So, all right, well, I felt fine until I looked in the mirror. So the answer is obviously, just don't look in the mirror. I heard about a man in China that ordered one of the first microscopes, and he was so fascinated looking at everything under the microscope, but then he looked at his rice under the microscope, and he saw there was all these microscopic creatures on the rice. He loved rice, so he threw away the, mi the microscope. So is the answer to just get rid of the law because I love my sin? That's the way a lot of people treat it. Or is the answer to use the mirror to try to take this off? Is that the solution? Is that the purpose of this? The law is not to take away our sin. So if this was a mark, forget it's taped for a minute, if it was a mark, how would I get rid of it? You've got to wash it, right? So... The law, the law shows me the sin, but I use this. What is this? Red, the clue, blood of Christ. What will wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so I do this, and then I do this. I feel much better. This did not take it away. This took it away. This showed me the need for this. Do we need this? then we need this to show us our need for this. We need the, the law to show us our need for the cleansing from sin. Amen? So, that's the purpose of the law. That's why we need it, and that's why the devil hates the law. Next question, number three. Can God's law be amended or repealed? What's the answer? What's the Bible say? Psalm 89, verse 34, My covenant I will not break. You with me? Nor alter. I'm not going to break it. I'm not going to alter it. The word that has gone out of my lips. So some are thinking right now, well, Doug, what about the new covenant? Stay with me. We'll get to that. Again, all of his precepts are sure. They stand fast. How long? forever and ever. And you can write your answers and you who have the lessons, don't forget you can download the lessons 
at the Pinnacle of Prophecy website, pinnacleprophecy.com. Some people want to follow along. They may not know that yet. Forever and ever, the commandments stand fast. You know, Billy Graham was a, uh, he had a tremendous record uh, preaching. They say that he preached visibly to 2.2 billion people. I'm not talking about through TV. I'm talking about just in person, more than any other person in history. And he used to have a, uh, a question and answer page that he would do where people would send in questions and he would give his answer. Um, this is one, Billy Graham's My Answer program. The question, does God still expect us to keep the Ten Commandments? Answer, the Ten Commandments are just as valid today as when God gave them to Moses over 3,000 years ago. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law. And then he goes on to say, there are laws that were ceremonial laws that are of a passing nature, but the Ten Commandments are eternal. And I couldn't agree more. The Ten Commandments do not alter. They do not change. By the way, does the law need changing or does the gospel change us? People are wanting to change the Bible to fit their sin. The Bible is supposed to change us to fit God's character. So the law does not change. The summary essence of the law is what? The law is all about love. I told you the law is a reflection of God's character, right? So we're going we're gonna to put up the commandments here, and I just want to show you how this uh, fills and how it's illustrated. If you look on the screen, you'll see what people at home are seeing. Pretty cool, huh? So here you've got the Ten Commandments. Now, there's one little thing about this uh, representation here. Technically, you'd have the first four commandments on one stone, and then the last six would be on the other. But this is a summary, and the artist put five on one and five on the other. So just to be accurate, it would actually be four and six. The first four commandments deal with our love for God. What's the great commandment? Wait, let me back up. God is love. So if you want to melt everything down, it's God is love. But now if you break that down a little bit, the two great commandments Jesus said are what? Love the Lord with all your heart. And the other one is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. I've got two arms with ten fingers. And these fingers do what the arms tell it to do. If we love God, will we keep the first four commandments? If we love God, will we take His name in vain? Will we worship other gods? Will we want to revere our time with Him? Will we honor His name? I did it out of order. But those are the first four. If we love Him, of course. Now let's go over here and consider for a minute the other commandments. So here you've got, technically, this would be the last six. Fifth commandment is honor your father and mother. If you love your father and mother, do you honor them? If you love, do you kill? Did you kill your neighbor? Do you lie to your neighbor? Do you steal from your neighbor? You don't commit adultery? You don't covet? Love, Paul says, is the fulfilling of the law. Amen? But some people are wanting to just get rid of the law and make it disappear. But, uh, well, there it goes. <laughs> I don't want to get rid of it. I thought that was pretty cool. They uh, were showing us how we could do this uh, virtual reality now while you're preaching. Soon they won't even need me. It's all going to be artificial intelligence. It's going to be <laughs> doing it. Should a born-again Christian keep the Ten Commandments? This is what we're talking about. New Testament born-again Christian. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. Wait, a, someone's saying, oh, well, that's Jesus' commandments. That'd be different from the Ten Commandments. Wait a second. Who gave the Ten Commandments? Jesus. Bible says, John says, all things that were made were made by him. That's his law. So when he said, if you love me, keep my commandments, he says, I have kept my Father's commandments and I abide in his love. Jesus lived a perfect life of obedience and it says he's given us an example that we should walk as he walked. Now, we may not feel perfect, but his life is an example of one of obedience to the law. Amen? Why? Because we love him. Now, by this we know that we know him if we do what? How do you know if you know him? If you keep his commandments. In fact, the Bible says, he that says I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar, John goes on to say. A lot of people say, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, and they just don't obey him. And if you really love them, you'll want to obey them. 
It's like this story C.D. Brooks used to tell about a, uh, a man that had a drinking problem. And he would always come home late at night stumbling drunk and his wife would get fed up and uh, she'd lock him out. And he'd stand down there on the first floor and he'd bellow upstairs to her window and say, oh, let me in, dear. Three words I've got for you. Three words. I love you. I love you. And he'd be out there and the neighbors would be waking up. She'd let him in. This happened all the time. He'd come home drunk. She'd lock him out. He'd say, I love you. I love you. And three words. I love you. And one day she finally had enough. And he came home drunk late that night and he started bellowing, I love you. Three words. She said, I've got two words for you. Prove it. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my law, keep my commandments. This is how we know that we know him. Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 13, it is not the hearers of the law that are justified, but the doers of the law will be justified. If that's clear, please say amen. amen. People often try to make Paul sound like he's getting rid of the law. This is about as clear as you can be. It is not the hearers of the law, but the doers that will be justified. He's, now, are we saved by keeping the law? No. Did God say to the children of Israel, here's my Ten Commandments, if you keep them, I'll get you out of Egypt? Or did He say, sacrifice this lamb and we'll begin a journey to the promised land? They were saved from slavery because of the blood of the Passover lamb, Jesus, right? Then they began a journey to the promised land. God said, now I've saved you. Who knows what's the first commandment? Thou shalt not have other gods, someone said. That's actually not it. That's the last half of it. Here's what it says. It says, God spoke all these words saying, here's where the carving began. I am the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The first part of the Ten Commandments, he gives a preamble and says, I am the God that saved you. Now if you love me, keep my commandments. We do not keep them to be saved. We keep them because we praise God that He's forgiven us and given us a new chance and that uh, hope of everlasting life. But doesn't living under grace through faith, this is question number six, make keeping the law, I got to back up, I went too, through it too quick. Doesn't living under, gra uh, under grace through faith make keeping the law non-essential? No. Romans 6.15, what does Paul say? What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? How does he respond? God forbid. People say, I'm not under the law. Now I'm under grace. I can break the law. He says, God forbid. And again, do we then make void the law through faith? What's the answer? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Let me see if I can illustrate that. I'm driving too fast. True story. And uh, I had just come off an interstate where you could go 70 miles an hour, and now I'm on a highway where I think it's like 55. I wasn't paying attention, and I passed the highway patrolman. I don't mean I passed him on the side. I mean, he was in the lane, and I passed him. I was so deep in thought. So he turned on his lights, and he pulled me over. And he said, now, you weren't going that fast, but I was following someone else, and you passed me. I said, officer, oh, I'm sorry. I said, can you have mercy? I didn't say I wasn't guilty. I admitted I was guilty. I said, I just came off an interstate and I, I wasn't paying attention. I'm in a hurry. And don't you love it when you're in a hurry and then you get pulled over? Then you got to drive really fast after he lets you go, right? <laughs> so I said, it's true. I said, well, you have mercy. And he said, all right, well, I'll write you a warning. Now, if it was real grace, he would have said, I'll pay it. But he said, I'll write you a warning. <laughs> and so he did have mercy on me. I didn't have to go to the courthouse or pay a fine. And so he, he went and wrote up a warning and said, okay, be careful, slow down out there. And uh, when he pulled me over and the lights came on, up until he pulled me over, I was free. When the lights came on, I was under the law. I did not want to pull over, but I'd broken the law and I was under the law. So I had to stop. But then he said, I'm going to forgive you. So I said, praise the Lord, officer. I am no longer under the law. I am under grace. So what I did is I revved my engine, vroom, 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 and I popped my clutch in second gear, and I peeled away fishtailing, spraying gravel all over the hood of the officer because I'm not under the law. I'm under grace now. Is that what I did? No. 
When he said, I'm going to let you go, and he was back there writing something down, how do you think I got back on the highway? I cleaned off my rearview mirror, and I cleaned off my side mirror, and I put on my blinker, and I waited till there were no cars in any direction for 10 miles, and I slowly creeped out on the highway, and I went 54 and a half miles an hour <laughs> and made everyone else mad because <laughs> I was going so slow. Why? I was under grace. I was grateful. So when we look at the cross and we see what our forgiveness has cost, do we want to break the law or are we more eager now to keep the law? Out of love, we want to be doers of the word. Can you say amen? amen? Was there a law in the Bible that was abolished? Now, this is important. A lot of people misunderstand. Yes. You can read here in Ephesians 2.14, he has what? Abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in, in what? Ordinances. There was a law of ordinances. These were revolving around the ceremonial laws. And again, you can read in Colossians 2, verse 13 and 14. He has done what? He's wiped out the handwriting. What kind of writing? It's not the finger of God writing. It's a handwriting which was against us, which was contrary to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. What were the Ten Commandments written on? What were the Mosaic laws written on? Paper, parchment. There are different laws, and it is true, Paul says, circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments is what matters. That can't be more clear. He says, don't worry about circumcision and the ceremony law, but keeping the commandments. What commandments is he talking about? Clearly, at least the Ten Commandments, right? And you can look in Deuteronomy chapter 4. I think I've got it marked here. Go to verse 13. So he declared to you his covenant which he commanded you to perform the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tables of stone. And the Lord and the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might observe them in the land that you cross over to possess. So you've got the Ten Commandments that were placed in the Ark of the Covenant, and then the Lord had Moses write out a long raft of Civil laws, ceremonial laws, health laws, and a lot of those laws are still the foundation for our society. Did you know that? Moses is the one who explained there is first degree murder and there's second degree murder and intent has a lot to do with it and if your neighbor's donkey wanders away, you should bring it back. And there's all kinds of great laws that God gave the children of Israel that became a foundation for laws all over the world. It, it's brilliant how smart it was. But the, um, the ceremonial laws that had to do with the sanctuary. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the holy place was torn from top to bottom, symbolizing that the purpose for the earthly sanctuary was fulfilled. Jesus said, destroy this temple made with hands, and then I will make one without hands. He spoke of what? His body. So the purpose for the ceremonial laws, do we need to sacrifice lambs, or is Jesus now the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world? So all of that was pointing to Christ. It's not physical circumcision. The Bible says it's circumcision of the heart. It's spiritual. These words I command you today shall be in your heart. Now, Pastor Doug, why are you doing this during a seminar on Revelation? Well, I'll get to that. Stay tuned. <laughs> Who is the devil's special target in the last days? The dragon was wroth, uh, King James says wroth, enraged with the woman, and he went to make war this is the Battle of Armageddon, by the way, with the rest of her offspring who do what? Who is the devil making war with in the last days? What is a woman? He's making war with a woman, a church that keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus. We'll be talking more about that. But you can't miss this, friends. You go to the book of Daniel, chapter 3, King of Babylon makes a law. His government law tells everybody to bow to a graven image. Those who do not bow to the image will be killed. But the Bible says, do not pray to images. Three Hebrews said we would rather go to the fiery furnace and disobey the government law, this government religious law, than God's law. And they were put in on test because of that law. You go to Daniel 6, 
Persian king makes a law. Everybody has to pray to him for King Darius for 30 days. Daniel says not to have other gods. That breaks the first commandment. He had to decide, who, who am I going to obey? In the last days, there is a law made that if you do not worship the beast in his image, you cannot buy or sell. Ultimately, there will be a death decree. I believe that's going to happen. So if we're fuzzy about what we're supposed to do with the Ten Commandments, friends, we're in big trouble. Because you've got the example in the Bible of these heroes that stood up at the point of being willing to die rather than disobey God willingly. So we need to know what we believe. The law of God, they are the commandments of the Almighty. Breaking them is sin. And that's why this is important, friends. There's going to be a battle between the dragon and the woman. Simple rule of life. Find out what God makes happy and do it. Find out what makes the devil happy, don't do it. Find out what makes the devil mad, do it. It says the dragon was wroth with the woman. Why? She keeps the commandments of God. That's a clue right there. It's a good idea. That it makes the devil mad. Because the devil wants you to sin, and sin is breaking the law of God. If you kill, it's a sin. I mean, if you murder, commit adultery, it's a sin. You lie, it's a sin. God wants His people to be holy. Amen? That's why it's called the holy law. And then you can read in Revelation 14, verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those, and this is in our, our foundation verse for Revelation 14, here are the ones that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God's people that survive this final trial are going to be obedient. They're going to believe in God. The Ten Commandments do not change. God's law does not need changing. The gospel is supposed to change us. It's written with his finger, spoken by his voice. It's eternal. All right. For by grace, I'm sorry, number nine. Are people saved by keeping the law? I want to just reemphasize this point. No, the Bible is very clear. For by grace you are saved, not uh, through faith, that it is a gift, I'm sorry, that it is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are saved by grace. Now, some people think, well, during the New Covenant, we're saved by grace, but during the Old Covenant, they were saved by law. Nobody is saved by works. Everybody is saved by grace. The Bible says Abraham is the father of the faithful. It says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. He was saved by faith. They were saved by faith looking forward to the cross. We are saved by faith looking back to the cross. But everybody's saved by the cross, friends. Nobody is getting to heaven by work. Amen. By works, amen? And then some people say, well, God didn't have the Ten Commandments until Moses. That's not true. Was it a sin to commit adultery before the Ten Commandments? Why did God tell Joseph, or Joseph told Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, says, I can't do this thing and sin against God. She tried to tempt him to commit adultery. He said, it's a sin. Ten Commandments had not been written yet. They knew it was a sin. In fact, just go all the way back to the beginning with Cain and Abel. God said to Cain, sin lies at the door. And he murdered his brother. And a curse was placed on him. It was a sin. Murder was a sin. So the Ten Commandments have been part of God's character all the way back. Just by the time of Moses, they wrote it down. Can a person be saved without keeping God's law? Maybe. Now let me explain. Will King David be in heaven? Will King David be in heaven? How many wives did he have? About ten and a number of concubines. Is that part of what God wants us to do? No. God winks at the times of ignorance. He was living up to the light he had. He did not know. Sin is knowing to do good and not doing it, according to James and Paul. So he didn't know. And so if there's something you're doing wrong you don't know, it's hard to repent of what you don't know. See what I'm saying? But if we knowingly sin, that's a very serious matter. If you want to enter into life, what does the Bible say? Keep the commandments. Jesus said, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Who's the wise man? He that hears these words of mine and does them is likened unto a man that builds his house on a what? A rock. What's the Ten Commandments written on? Stone. What does David use to bring down Goliath? Stone. What destroys the image in Daniel 2? This is for the 
Good Bible students. Stone. This is the Word of God, the law of God. It's a foundation. He that builds on the rock, the storm comes, his house stands. So don't be afraid of the law of God. Again, Revelation, this is the last chapter in the Bible. I mean, if you want something clear, blessed. How many want to be blessed? Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they might have a right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates of the city. How many of you want to be blessed? He says, the doers of law. And again, Leviticus 18, verse 5, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does them, he'll live by them. Now, when you hear a message like this, I know it, it may it frighten you a little bit. You said, oh man, there might be areas in my life where I'm disobeying. Every area in your life where if you see any, if there's a dishonesty, if there's any sin, and keep in mind, Jesus said the Ten Commandments are not just the literal outward uh, obedience. It's also the inner attitude. You may not commit adultery, but Jesus said you can do that in your heart, you know? The Bible says you not only may not murder, but Christ said if you are angry with your brother without cause, you're guilty of murder. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Some people may not lie literally, but they're a little deceptive in the way they communicate. And if you're an honest, spirit-filled Christian, that Holy Spirit's going to convict you every time you start getting near the spiritual edge of the law, not just the literal edge. And that's, what's, that's what it means to be a Christian. You want to be led by the Spirit. Not just obeying the letter, but obeying the spirit of the law and the letter. You need both. What is the outcome? Question number 11. In your lessons, I'm glad to see a lot of you, your heads go down, you start writing, you're following along. You'll have all the answers to give Bible studies when you're done. What is the outcome of keeping God's law? Drudgery. A burden. Is that, some people act like that. No. Statistically, it says, I've spoken these things to you that you're joy may be full. Don't believe the lie that happiness comes from disobedience. Misery comes from disobedience. People that live lives of lawlessness, typically, you know, they're incarcerated. They're having all kinds of problems and fines and judge court appearance. And, and uh, I picked up a hitchhiker one day. This just came to me. And uh, riding along invariably, he said, uh, so what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor. He said, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm just not a practicing Christian. I said, what does that mean? He said, well, I got this cross here. <laughs> and as we drove along, he's, he's telling me about all the problems he's had with the law, and he's been in court and had to you know, divorce his wife. And, and I said, you say you're a Christian, but you're not a practicing Christian. There's really no such an animal. Christ said, you're either with me or against me. I said, maybe all the problems you're having is because you haven't surrendered to Jesus. And when you obey, you're going to find peace. Great peace have they that love my law and nothing will offend them. I forget the reference, but I quoted that accurately. Yeah, I heard someone else spot it. God will give you peace, great peace. Again, happy is he who does what? Who keeps the law. How many of you want that happiness? Oh, actually, it's in my lesson. I forgot. Here it is. Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace have those that love your law. I wonder why it was in my mind. It's in my lesson. <laughs> Nothing will make them stumble. What kind of peace? Jesus and Paul, they tell us God's going to give you a peace that passes understanding. When you surrender and say, Lord, forgive my sin, He not only gives you forgiveness for past sins, when you come to Jesus, He then gives you power to live a new kind of life. When Christ was baptized, He came out of the water. Holy Spirit came down. He went into the wilderness and he fought with the devil and was victorious. As an example for you and me, Jesus was not baptized for his sin. When we surrender our lives to the Lord and we commit our lives to the Lord, he promises the gift of the Holy Spirit. You can read in Acts chapter 2. It says, Peter says, repent, be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and your children and as many as the Lord God shall call. He gives us the Spirit to obey his law. Amen? And I love this, Deuteronomy 6, verse 24. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good, always, that He might preserve us alive as it is this day. And I threw in another scripture as a bonus for you. It's not in your lesson, 
Deuteronomy 5. I like this because God begins with the word, oh. Translate that for me. Oh, it's the heart of God breaking. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they'd fear me and always keep, how many commandments? All of my commandments. How often? Always. That it might be well with them and their children. It'll not only bless you, but it blesses your children. For how long? Forever. He offers us eternal life. God promises joy and peace when we keep His law. But why do we do it? I remember hearing a story about a um, father told his teenage son, son, can you go mow the lawn? And the kid had other things he wanted to do and he was playing computer games or something. He said, oh, mow the lawn, mow the lawn. And so he goes out there and he pulls out the lawn mower and he doesn't check the gas or oil or anything. He cranks it up and he just kind of runs around the yard for a minute and takes a shortcut through mom's flowers and puts it away, doesn't clean it off or anything. And, and uh, father looks out there and he sees the grass. it got all these slivers and it looks like mohawk haircuts everywhere. It just didn't do a very good job. That boy borrowed his parents' car without asking. Then he got into an accident and someone was injured. He was taken to jail. He was over 18. And uh, he's being held, driving without a license. Parents came to get him out and they said, there's bail. There's a very high bail. The person was badly injured. Parents had to take out a loan, bail out their son. While the son was waiting for court, parents had to hire a lawyer, spend thousands. The son found out about the bills that they were paying. And his parents continued to love him Say, we're going to get through this. Don't be discouraged. You made a mistake. It's not the end of the world. Your life will go on. But it was really hurting them financially, all the legal fees. And the father said, son, can you go mow the lawn? He went out there and he sharpened the blade and he cleaned it off and he checked the oil, he checked the gas and he manicured the lawn. Did a good job, cleaned it up, put it away. What made the difference? He saw how much his parents loved him. He saw the, what the price that they were paying for his freedom. And he realized it's a pretty small thing for me to mow the lawn. So when Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, he's shown us how much he loves him, or he loves us, right? He said, I've given my life. If you want to know how bad sin is, disobedience, look at the blood at the cross. It's a miracle, friends. I don't know how red blood can wash away sin. But as uh, one pastor said, I don't know how a black cow can eat green grass and make white milk and yellow butter. But I believe it. And it works. There are millions of people that will tell you it works. How many of you want to say, Lord, help me to be a doer and not just a hearer? Father in heaven, be with everyone here. Those watching, give us the gift of the Spirit. Help us know what it means to not just be hearers, but doers of your word, and bring us back again to prepare to serve you better and live in the last days. In Christ's name, amen. Don't forget, when is our next study, friends? Tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about the subject of worship and how it is a battle in the last days. It's not too late to bring your friends and you at home. Download the lessons, pinnaclesofprophecy.com. God bless, and you have a good evening. Thank you very much.